It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. T. Lamar Cordell, former assistant United States Attorney General. Well, Mr. Cordell, now that you are back in private life and done with being a bureaucrat, Perhaps you can tell us something about the pressures that were brought on you when you were Assistant Attorney General. What kind of pressures are they? Well, Mr. Hatchett, the pressures were, I would say, in the third dimension, if you can understand that. But they came largely from the senators and the congressmen, almost continuously from the prominent men in public life that were over on the hill. They come in the form of telephone calls or visits or what? Well. The, the greater number of communications, of course, were over the telephone, but, uh, but there were many, many conferences that were had with senators and congressmen in my office. And if the senator happened to be a little older and so busy, I would accommodate the gentleman go to his office. What would be a typical request? A typical request? Well, would tax cases, for example, oh, uh, be involved? Oh, yes. When I was in the tax division, tax cases would be involved. I, I remember one uh, which troubled me a great deal, uh, most one of the very beloved, uh, one of the most beloved men in America. I surely do love him, and I have quoted him so many times. That was the vice president when they called me about an old friend of his down in Louisville. He wanted a favor from you, sir? Well, sir, he was, he was, uh, he was concerned about the, the illness of this fellow. And I told him that everybody who came to see me about tax cases was sick or something. They were sick. Something, something was wrong with them. And I told him that uh, the doctors and the government doctors felt that that the ordeal of a trial would not result in the gentleman's death and the, there was no other alternative but to go ahead with the unpleasant duty well, of... Well, now, Mr. Cardell, to identify you a little further for our viewers, of course, you're this man from... No you're from North Carolina, I believe. Yes, I'm from North Carolina. And then for about four years, you were uh, in the... Uh, tax division of the uh, Department of Justice. That's right. And you had the say, the authority to either prosecute a, a tax case or yes, else to sir. settle it. Yes, sir. It and was that, that's what brought you under all these pressures. That's right. Um, unfortunately, you can't delegate this power to another unless in your absence. And you would really have to stand then up. Then all these committees got after you and then the president himself hauled off and fired you, didn't he? Yes, sir. He really broke loose on me. <laughs> he well, sure I, did. <laughs> I thought that Truman had a, had a reputation of sticking by everybody. All his good friends. You were one of his good friends. I you? sure thought so. <laughs> I tell you, he broke the legend though when he when he uh, when he when he knocked me out. What, what, what makes what's your theory as to why the president uh, singled you out and gave you the boot in such a fashion? Well, I. It would take too long to go into my theories. Well, that's right. you, <laughs> you're, our, our viewers, of course, know you yeah. as one of these mink men. Uh, your your wife uh, at least got a, got out of Washington with a mink coat, didn't she? Well, she got out of one that was paid for. That was one thing, and she paid for it. I have to the last part, though. I see. And, and uh, it was uh, Well, did thing. that mink coat have anything to do with it? I don't much believe it. I don't believe it did. Uh, Mrs. Truman has a mink coat, and, and uh, I reckon a uh, mother who has... Uh, Long one for so uh, one and one for so long, and and she argued that it would last for ten years, just renovate uh, to be renovated just uh, once a year. That it was all right. I told her it would certainly get me into trouble if she bought it. What specifically were were you charged with whenever you were fired? Well, outside activities. I've been trying to find out, Mr. Huey, what the outside activities were. Does that just mean doing favors for your friends? I, I don't know. It's one of those things that uh, the president did not tell the attorney general, Mr. McGrath. I tried to find out. I've been trying to find out what these outside activities were. Well, um, Mr. Cordell, you yes, were... Sir, I, I, I really don't know. 
Uh, at the uh, end of one of the committee hearings, the chairman of a subcommittee, uh, Congressman King, a year ago, asserted that you had been recreant to your trust and had done irreparable damage to the government. Now, what is your comment on that statement? Yeah, he said, he said I, had, I had done a disservice to my government. And I say to you, Mr. Hazard, when, when uh, Chairman Cecil King made that remark, he, he did a disservice to his government, and he did a disservice to the honorable people in that tax division. How many? Yeah, I didn't like that statement either. How many tax no, cases, do about it, in though. the four years you were, you were in this tax position, sir, how many cases would you estimate that you handled? Approximately 16,000 civil cases. Probably 45% were compromised and settled, and approximately 2,500 income tax fraud cases. I see. Now, these cases, you, you, uh, I'd like you to tell our viewers, uh, you, you get calls from members of Congress uh, during this period very often, didn't you? Oh, yes, sir. And those members of Congress, uh, they wanted you to, to uh, favorably consider uh, their constituents, I assume. Yes, sir, they had... That's part of the system, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes, they were, they were, they were, a uh, strong representation had been made to these gentlemen. They were honorable in all of their relations with me. Uh, they were, some were very much convinced that uh, I was about to do an injustice by indicting someone. And of course, I would try to convince the congressman that I had no other alternative because the facts were so strong that, that it just had to be done. Well, I'd like to take up one specific case. Let's take the case of the Kansas City vote frauds. Right. Now, you were in on that for a while. That's were right. you called in by anybody, or did you step in by yourself? Most no, of the Kansas City in, uh, uh, investigation uh, stemmed from a good many calls that we received in the way of complaints from individuals out in the congressional district that uh, Congressman Axtell and uh, Congressman Slaughter. Now, this, this was in 1946. Yes, so that was when and I was in charge. Congressman Axtell of was the uh, congressman that uh, the Democratic candidate that President Truman favored. Yes. Sir. And it was, it was argued that fraud was used to elect him over his Democratic opponent. Oh, that was it, the case. Was yes, that? so that yes. was the case. The president and a lot of... Uh, uh, to do was done about it in Kansas City, oh, yes. and then it came to your attention. Is that what that's happened? That's right, yes. that's right. Now, sir, uh, just by way of information, uh, how does a man who's been district attorney down in North Carolina, how does he get a position such as you occupied in Washington? Some senator bring you there? No, sir. No senator had anything to do with my going to Washington. Um, Mr. Clark told me that when I took over the office as United States Attorney, it had the lowest rating in the United States, and when, and when um, he wanted one to fill the vacancy that he had created by accepting the, the Attorney Generalship of the country, uh, he said that because of the splendid record which I had made, uh, he had talked with the President, and they had decided to extend the invitation to me. And that was why I came to Washington. Uh, neither Senator Huey, who was Senator then, or Senator Bailey, I believe, Senator Bailey, uh, neither one of the gentlemen uh, knew uh, about the invitation to come, and of course, Mr. Clark told me he went to see them personally. Then after you get uh, such a position uh, where you have the decision over many dollars, millions of dollars in tax cases, all of these calls that you get from the White House, from members of Congress, uh, that's inherent in our system, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's, uh, it is a very, very normal thing that one who has, who has to make the decision, he has to face it. That's just all this. Well, Dr. Cordell, I'd like to get back to, to this specific case that we took up because I think it would uh, clarify the whole situation mm -hmm. if we went into something like, let's say, the Kansas City vote case. Now, you were called in on that, and you stayed in for a while, and then you were taken off it? Well, Is that right? No, what, what happened, Mr. Hazard, was that um, the preliminary investigation, this preliminary investigation had become quite a famous memoranda, memorandum. Uh, the FBI had uh, completed its uh, preliminary investigation in embracing all oh, of the, the Kansas City all, case. Yes, yes. Of the Kansas City case, embracing the investigation of the Kansas City Star. Yes. They had uh, uh, 50 investigators, and there were 8,000 people interviewed, and out of that number, 1,354 affidavits were taken. And that was a part of the preliminary investigation that was reported to me by the FBI. Now, of course, we analyzed these things. You turned it over to the FBI. Well, we... You asked them to investigate. We asked them to, to, um, to make a preliminary investigation so uh, uh, to determine because we knew if we had a full 
investigation, it would cost a staggering sum of money because it would cost almost $300,000. Well, did the dollars. president call you off that investigation or no, was it no, through his no, orders no, that sir. you were called off? Oh, no, no, no. And I, no, sir. Uh, I was, um, I, I, rece I never received any communication from the White House from any source. And we all really believe that the facts were not sufficient to warrant a further investigation because we could not find where there was any evidence that two or more people conspired together to deprive someone of a right well, to vote. Mr. Cardell, uh, one of the important things to you, <coughs> I believe, is that in the last two or three weeks, you've un undergone extensive investigation in Washington by the Chelf Committee. That's right. Uh, after which, uh, Mr. Chelf uh, uh, more or less rendered this judgment in which he said that you were, quote, an honest man who was indiscreet in his associations and a pliant conformer to the peculiar moral climate of Washington. Climate now, uh, is that a fair uh, uh, description of, of your experience, eh, sir? Well, I know that the chairman and Mr. Keating was right when they said to the American people that I was an honest man. I have no disagreement there at all, and I know they're right. Now, they and spoke of the peculiar moral climate of Washington. Is well, it peculiar? It, it is the most peculiar. I think they were right there. It was the most it's the most peculiar moral climate you'll find any city in the world. Everybody who gets off at Union Station, off a bus, or when he parks his car, or comes in from the National Airport, he goes to Washington for something. And he's disappointed if he does not take it home with him. I see. Well, I'm sure that uh, our viewers have very much appreciated these frank statements from you tonight, sir, and thank you for being with us. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. T. Lamar Caudle, former Assistant United States Attorney General. A watchmaker such as Longines recalls that Christopher Columbus made his great voyages before the watch was invented. His only timepiece, an hourglass, like this 15th century one, which happens to be the property of the Hayden Planetarium. This, of course, had to be reversed every half hour. Now, Columbus Day marks a milestone for Longines watches, too, because this gold medal was presented to Longines at the St. Louis Columbian Exhibition, which honored the 400th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America. Now, consider how consistently Longines watches have maintained their leadership over the years. Longines is the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and literally thousands of awards for accuracy from great government observatories. Today's Longines watches are our finest. Distinguished for exclusive styling, endowed with those traditional qualities of accuracy and long life for which Longines watches are world honored. Truly, throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866 maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that on election day, you're the most important person in the country. So exercise your privilege as an American citizen and vote for the candidate of your choice. Now Tuesday nights, leave it to Larry on the CBS television network.